multidisciplinary approach. The following will um, outline the potential of bioarchaeology and historic context to produce a comprehensive understanding of the cultural and social aspects of the Hospital of St James, which is located at Thornton Abbey in Lincolnshire, England. Um, I'll briefly introduce the nature of the medieval hospital in England and the Hospital of St James, leading into an ex exploration of the demographic profile of the cemetery and a discussion about the bioarchaeological techniques that I intend to apply. Um, so hospitals of medieval England were religious institutions that provided arms and hospitality. They cared for the individual through their soul, clean living, um, diet and shelter. And they're commonly categorised into four main categories, um, which are those that cared for the lepers, those that cared for the sick poor, those run as almshouses and those that acted as hostels or hospices for um, the poor wayfarer or pilgrim. The hostel community consisted of religious and lay persons cohabiting in one establishment. Um, and this most commonly um, consisted of 12 inmates, a single hospital master, 10 lay and clerical brothers, and six or so servitors. The combination of these people is vital in developing our understanding of the hospital's demographics and its social functions. And then, just quickly, of the approximated 1,146 hospitals operating in, in medieval England and Wales, less than 5% have been subject to archaeological investigation so far. So it's quite a good opportunity. Um, so the Hospital of St James um, was excavated from 2011 to 2016. It provides the opportunity to explore a rural medieval hospital set on the uh, boundary of a monastic precinct. Um, and the only known historical documentation to the hospital was written in the Thornton Chronicle in 1322, which states repairs, was there, repairs um, were made to the Chapel of St James at the hospital without the walls. Um, and although the, the whole chronicle hasn't been uh, translated yet, so there may be more in there, but that's all we have at the moment. Uh, so in order to gain a broader insight into the hospital, three skeletons were, had radiocarbon dating carried out on them. Uh, the results turned up calibrated dates from 1295 to 1440, although you can see here that each individual um, produced more accurate dates. This combines with the reference made um, in the Thornton Chronicle, which shows the hospital was in use in 1322, um, and it must have been for some time, considering they were making repairs to it, you would think. Um, and then also with a grave slab, which was discovered within the hospital chapel, uh, on which a year of death was dated to be 1317. So in this case, the archaeological and historical record work together to provide a broad time um, frame of the cemetery, as well as specific events that happened within its lifetime. Um, the grave in question uh, offered an exceptional opportunity to display the integration of the historical and bioarchaeological evidence. Uh, it was possible to identify the individual, as the grave slab states their name, which was Richard de Wispetum. His death was on the 13th of April, 1317, and evidence as to his occupation is on there. Um, as you can see in the main portion of the grave slab, it depicts a man in clerical robes uh, with tonsured hair and holding a chalice, which are all representative of a priest or canon at the time. Uh, on inspection, the skeleton confirmed what we know so far, that it was in fact a male. He was approximately 36 to 45 years at his time of death. Um, and this is emphasised that the cooperation of material culture and skeletal remains can produce extensive biographical information more than either could have produced by itself. Um, so an analysis of the whole cemetery population is currently being conducted to gain a better understanding of the broad demographics of the site. So far, 110 of the 195 skeletons uh, has revealed an unconventional demographic. Both the distribution of biological sex and age at death presented extremes. Um, so firstly, females account for just 1.8% of the cemetery population. Um, the high male presence is indicative of a monastic community for which a single sex population is apparent across many monastic sites throughout Britain. However, you would expect a higher female presence here, considering the exceptionally high number of non-adults, some of which were as young as three months um, at the time of death. 
So the age distribution for the population demonstrates that a large 48% were aged 17 years and younger at death. Um, with those aged 6 to 11 years uh, accounting for the highest proportion at just over 26% of the population. Um, this pro proportion of immature individuals is unprecedented at hospital cemeteries across England. Um, the closest comparison you can see here is St Mary's Special in London where 33% of the population were 15 years and uh, under at the top, their age, time of death, sorry. Um, so this significant difference suggests that something special or slightly weird is going on at our hospital. Uh, the paleopathological evidence starts to shed light on this population. Firstly, among the adult population, four individuals presented with signs of DISH, um, a condition of the spine which is linked to calorie consumption and therefore indicative of a high status lifestyle. Um, and whilst 10 individuals present, presented with creeper orbitalia, a condition associated with dietary deficiencies. Um, the presence of these two conditions together uh, suggests that the population was consuming different diets or had a different status of diet at the time. Um, individuals also presented with conditions that called for medical intervention or long-term care. Uh, we have an individual here which has an amputation to just distal of the knee joint um, and then the far one is of a break to the proximal femur, um, both of which show really, um, really good signs of healing and that the, these individuals live through them and live for some time. Um, Whilst when we look at the immature population, 18 presented with underdeveloped growth of their long bones when compared with age attained by their dental development, indicating the possible effects of suppressed immunological systems or malnutrition. One individual, which you can see on the end here, uh, presented with synostotic scaphocephaly, which is the fusion of the sag sagittal suture um, from the front to the back of the skull, which restricts skulls, the skull's growth and can lead to serious complications, including uh, deformities, increased cranial pressure, seizures, and developmental delays. So from this individual alone, it's evident that the hospital was housing some seriously ill individuals. And then finally, in the middle here, we have um, an individual that presented with osteom osteomyelitis of the uh, forearm. This infection is usually as a result of a break, but there was no break present on this individual. So the only other form is when the infection gets into your bloodstream. And so again, has it can happen to a perfectly healthy individual, but it has seriously debilitating and possibly life-threatening results. Um, so being presented with such a myriad of conditions, a number of methodologies are required to assess the full extent of the population's conditions and the outcomes they reflect. So it's evident from the pathological data that an examination of diet would be useful to look at nutritional consumption and resource distribution among the hospital. Considering the dating evidence, um, this line of inquiry will look for evidence of the Great Famine via nutritional status, um, and this will reflect the impact of the 13th and 14th centuries downturn on this rural, monastic and charitable institution. Um, it will be used to investigate indications of social grouping among the populations, so the lay population versus the religious or monastic population. Um, the control for this will be to look for deprivation among those with the uh, creeper or batalia and excess calorie consumption by those with dish. Uh, this is possible as carbon isotopes indicate ratios of plant, marine and terrestrial protein. And then finally, carbon isotopes, isotope ratios derived from the teeth will be utilised to explore whether ill health in immatures uh, is related to undernourishment or considering the high proportion of them with the skeletal um, stunted growth. Uh, this methodology will add to our understanding of the larger social, economic and political issues at the time um, among, among this niche population. Uh, so hospitals for the poor wayfarer and pilgrims are a category in their own right. 
The need for such establishments rose in line with the establishment of pilgrim routes throughout the country and were called for as many people going on pilgrimages um, were motivated to do so as a result of ill health. The analysis of oxygen and strontium, strontium and lead isotopes, um, will be utilised to explore the possibility um, sorry, of people who have migrated to the hospital within Britain or from further afield. Uh, lead isotopes can be used to trace the level of pollutants an individual has been exposed to and therefore individuals from rural origins will have lower levels um, derived from local rocks and soils whereas those from urban uh, locations which have travelled to the hospital uh, which have much higher traces. And this will help to paint a picture of the hospital's inmates by establishing where they came for and why they were travelling to this particular place. Um, and then finally, um, within the hospital, 26 select burials, which are the dark green phase of burial you can see here, um, were interred in a, in a discrete phase of burial, which composed of one triple, four doubles and five single burials. Um, these are comprised of males and immatures, with one possible female. So this raises queries as to the reasoning behind such burial practices. The theory which has provoked much discussion is the possibility of familial relations. Um, however, in an archaeological context, you usually find that it's mother and child or two immature individuals that are interred in these like two double burials. So the application of DNA analysis would generate an understanding of the genetic filiation of, of the individuals uh, achieved through the application of hierarchical AGNA uh, with a primary aim of addressing paternal lineage. Um, and this line of investigation will either result in a successful identification of familial relations or it will establish that the choice of burial practice was the result of something else, maybe more practical means, um, but we, ju we just don't know yet. <laughs> um, also from the DNA analysis, it would be really interesting if we can to sex the non-adults and therefore see if they're following the same uh, trend in sex bias as to who's been accepted to the hospital. Um, and then just to conclude, it's evident that the combination of bioarchaeological research methods with historical research produces a more comprehensive understanding of the medieval hospital. Um, this research will go on to incorporate accounts of monastic caregiving and systems of relief to further elucidate the presence of the individuals with severe health conditions um, at the hospital and to assess the location of the hospital on the precinct boundary. Um, the presence of children adds an interesting and unexpected addition to the hospital, which we didn't expect, um, by, by establishing the function of the hospital, such as who it cared for, um, it will be possible to discuss the role of the hospital in more depth and in relation to the wider community, um, therefore giving a broader understanding of the role of the rural hospital because a lot of hospitals that have been looked at so far are in urban locations, so it's a quite a unique opportunity that we have.